Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to first pass things off to uh, my wonderful friend and comrade, Nico, uh, to take us through a welcome and uh, some tech housekeeping for us. And then we're going to move into a land acknowledgement. And then we're going to move into uh, some more of the content of our day. Uh, so with that said, off to you, Nico. Thank you, Malcolm. And I'm just gonna give it a few more seconds for folks to come in. And you see that the live caption is active. So um, I'll give more instructions for tech, but if you need live captioning, there's a closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please folks feel free to um, use that so you can turn that on. Um, we have 200 folks um, over here. Welcome, mm -hmm. so exciting. Yeah, let's, let's start. Let's go, let's go ahead. <laughs> All right, so thank you everyone. I am Nico, I am the Senior um, Training and Client Engagement Manager at Trace Forward and also um, Head Curator for the Race and Webinar Series um, in which um, today's webinar is a part of. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about who Race Forward is and what the Race and Series is about. So we are Race Forward. Um, we are the biggest multiracial racial justice organization in the country. Um, and you can see some of our projects um, on the screen right now. Of course, you know us from Color Lines, um, basically our daily news website that reports on everything that you see in mainstream media but with a racial justice lens and we have our facing race conference happening this year as well as well as our government alliance on race and equity um, our membership program for government institutions who are trying to advance equity racial equity within their institutions and of course our mass freedom work, um, which is a cross-departmental effort that really tries to imagine a world um, where everyone is liberated, where everyone um, is free um, and using an abolitionist frame. And the thing that um, remains true about Trace Forward, even as our project shift, our strategy shift, is that we are an organization that really tries to hold ourselves accountable to communities of color. Um, next slide, Malcolm. And just for context, and Malcolm will say more about how we frame our webinars and analysis that we use, but um, today's um, webinar is part of our race and webinar series. Um, our race and webinar series puts race at the forefront of our conversations to say that um, if we are not putting race um, at the forefront, then we are not gonna address racism um, in our strategies. Um, our race and webinar series also um, talks about race explicitly but not exclusively um, and really using an intersectional lens um, which Malcolm will also talk more about later um, and yeah and here is our um, tech just some short tech guide for folks um, so the chat is open right now but once we go to once we finish our land acknowledgments we'll close the chat and folks can feel free to chat um, the panelists in case you have any um, any sort of issue and we also have the Q&A button there where we will collect your questions um, we will have two um, opportunities for the Q&A and finally we have a closed caption um, button which you can use to um, activate the closed captioning and lastly I want to introduce um, the folks that are with us today um, we have amazing, you see on the screen, Shannon, who is um, one of our ASL interpreters. Um, along with Shannon is also Carolyn Boykins. Um, Carolyn, do you mind just saying hi to the camera if you're able to, just so we can see your face? Hello, thank you so much for joining us. And lastly, we have um, Heather Easterly, who is doing live caption. Heather, I wonder if you're able to um, also say hi to the camera for us as you're typing our caption. If not, okay, I will see you later. And me, of course, and of course, Emmy. Emmy, if you just wanna say hi um, to folks by showing your face on camera. Hello, Emmy, thank you. 
and yeah, we have a great team of people, but really, I want to pass on the mic to <laughs> the star of the show, my amazing friend and colleague who is really, who has led this particular webinar all throughout from all the research, the content, and the facilitation. And Malcolm will say more about um, themselves later on, but just wanna pass the mic on to Malcolm Shanks. Thank you so much, Malcolm, for, for, for doing this for Race Forward. Thank you so much, Nico. Thank you, Shannon, Carolyn, Heather, and Emmy for being such an amazing access team in advance. I already know we're about to do a great job together. Um, I feel like I have to do that self-deprecating thing where I say, I am definitely not the star of this show. Um, hopefully, the star of this show will be these like amazing visuals that I spent a lot of time on. Uh, so with that said, we're going to go through and do some of them. Uh, and we're going to look through uh, First, we're gonna start off uh, with a land acknowledgement because it's always important uh, that if we are talking about anything having to do with race, uh, especially in the United States, uh, in the Western Hemisphere generally, uh, that we talk about how the basis of this uh, racial hierarchy and the racial structure in the United States is the theft of indigenous land. Uh, past and ongoing policies of displacement and genocidal warfare against indigenous peoples, and also a public culture that erases Native American people and glorifies the violence that was required to conquer uh, a continent. And so uh, I've put a map here uh, in front of us. Um, this is a map of the stolen lands, just for a comparison here. Uh, the, in the red, in the sort of deeper, darker red here, we have the current reservations or the current land in which indigenous people are sovereign over their own uh, affairs. And then we have the rest of it, which used to be indigenous land and is still indigenous land actually, which used to be sovereign indigenous land, I should say, and is now under the colonial occupation of the United States government. And so there are a couple of things, of course, that are missing or in or even historically inaccurate about this map. And so I want to name those because I don't want us to think um, that this is the way that indigenous land looks, right? Uh, one is that the borders of the United States were never predetermined. They were never a foregone conclusion. And so uh, the borders, for example, in the South, um, uh, with Mexico is only about 150 years old and the border in the north uh, was also negotiated about 150 to 200 years ago. Those were done without indigenous people um, and, in many and in many places were done in order to control or uh, uh, split apart indigenous people from one another. And so there are lots of indigenous communities that don't recognize the colonial borders of the United States, Canada, or Mexico and North America. They've had to deal with many European empires, the succession of European empires, and then those specific colonial governments. And so in many ways, it's necessary to say that uh, these borders have been just as much shaped by indigenous resistance uh, as much as they have been by European policies. And so uh, I'm getting a note that it's really quiet. I just want to check in. Is anybody else um, getting quiet for me or can you all still hear me pretty clearly? Good here. Okay, I'm seeing. Okay, excellent. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue. Um, the other thing I want to note is that there are like some dark splotches here that are about the places that were already occupied formally by, by, uh, by European settlers during that time. So there's a spot a splotch around Los Angeles or Southern California and Nevada. There's a splotch around Texas and Louisiana, which used to be France, and a bit on the East Coast, uh, which and what's clear, uh, or what should be clear, is that all of this is stolen indigenous land. Um, from in the east, we are talking about uh, the Muscogee and the Creek, all the way at the in the southeastern uh, United States now, or the southeast of Turtle Island, as indigenous people refer to it, uh, all the way to the Lenape uh, and the Haudenosaunee, who I'll be talking about a little bit. 
uh, all the way up to what is now the colonial border of the United States, where the Abenaki, the people of the Don, are located. And the other thing that we should also mention that someone is saying, thank you, Melissa, is that we cannot forget that the United States has acquired lots of colonial territories that are also indigenous lands that are not in the continental United States. For example, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Samoa, Chamorro, Midway Island, right? All of these are indigenous land and all of these are uh, stolen and, and uh, conquered indigenous lands as well, right? The list can go on and on. Yeah, absolutely. But I want to be a little bit more specific about the land that I'm currently occupying. And so uh, the land that I'm currently in is uh, Lenape territories. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And so technically that would be a uh, Canarsie or Rockaway uh, tribe within the Lenape nation. Lenape means original people in the dialects of Lenape. And uh, the Lenape language is a few different dialects. Uh, and so Lenape means original people in all of them. Uh, Lenape has a matrilineal kinship culture, which means that if anyone wants to know who you are, who you belong to, they're going to ask who your mother is. That's what's going to be important. It's also true that the Lenape created and maintained extraordinary trade routes. Uh, the, if I were to go into the south of Manhattan right now, uh, Broadway, which is one of the most famous streets, I would say, possibly in the United States, um, besides Main Street, I guess. <laughs> it stretches all the way from the southern tip of Manhattan, uh, all the way to the northern tip of Manhattan now, um, but used to extend far beyond that into uh, what's now Connecticut and also what uh, originally it went all the way to Wampanoag Mashpee territories or Mashpee Wampanoag territories in Boston and what is now uh, colonially known as Boston. There were fisheries that were also maintained in order to uh, keep fish that uh, growing that were coming through the Hudson Valley or the Hudson River Valley, as well as uh, the Delaware Bay and agricultural forests, uh, such that when settlers first got to this area of the world, uh, they actually could just drive their uh, you know, horses and uh, wagons in between trees and thought they were just in some sort of wildly beautiful um, uncurated natural space. And what is real, <laughs> what is reality, is that they were simply unable to see the work that had been that had gone into creating agricultural forests. Uh, Lelanape and many other people of the eastern woodlands simply would go to where the food grew well and would continue to help it grow there. And so that is one of the reasons why uh, the forests look the way they did. The uh, entry of Europeans into Lenape Hoking or Lenape territory or the land of the original people in uh, the dialects of Lenape uh, happened around the early uh, 1500s, actually. Um, some of the first people in this area were European settlers or were Italian. However, the first uh, colony colonizers in this area to actually settle the southern tip of Manhattan were Dutch and they attempted uh, to parlay with the Lenape people or to get land from them. One of the ways that they did that uh, was by treachery, if I'm to be honest. Uh, basically, the Lenape people have a different concept of land use. To give a gift for the use of another's land is not necessarily to, uh, to buy that land or to then own that land. And so uh, that created some, some people say misunderstanding, I would say treachery on the part of the Dutch uh, who got that land. And so we can see a map here. Uh, Wall Street is another famous street in the United States that comes from this area. Uh, actually, the major in the top left corner of your screen, you'll, you'll be able to see a large sort of uh, street, and that is Broadway the original Lenape Trail. And then the wall that you can see uh, that that is crossing is what is now known as Wall Street and was Wall Street then. What is true is that it was always an exclusion zone. Uh, wall Street was named that because it was created to keep 
Lenape people out of the Dutch colony, and it became a known as a well-known marketplace because the walls were where European settlers would come to trade with the Lenape people whose home they were occupying. It is also true uh, that one of the first slave markets in the continental United States was built on Wall Street. That wall, as a matter of fact, was built by enslaved Africans of the Dutch. And so Wall Street in and of itself is uh, a kind of international story here. Uh, we have uh, basically a, an area where European settlers come into indigenous land. They then stole that land from them, used enslaved Africans or the labor of enslaved Africans to build some of the infrastructure of that land, and then uh, continued to, and then actually sold that land later to the British for a very small island in Indonesia that had lots of nutmeg and mace that they wanted to, con to complete their sort of colonization of Southeast Asia at that point. So we actually have a really international story that involves the Lenape people. The Lenape people uh, were successful in fighting off the Dutch, and it's one of the reasons that the Dutch decided to sell the colony to the British. Uh, the majority of Lenape land, however, was taken uh, in what was called the Walking Purchase of 1737. It was, it was in many ways tricked out of Lenape hands and forced out of Lenape hands by the children of William Penn, who's the namesake of Pennsylvania, the state. Lenape land is mostly in uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, uh, Southern Connecticut, and uh, Southern New York. And so one of the things they did, and this is a really fascinating story, is that uh, they took a fake deed that William Penn had uh, not gotten signed and not had agreed to by the Lenape people of the Delaware Valley. And they took it and they said, hey, uh, you all agreed to this. And so you must give us land that equals uh, a one and a half days walk from the Delaware Creek to from the Delaware River to someplace different. Um, and so what they did at that point when the Delawares, uh, which is a European name for the Lenape uh, Delawares, uh, the De when the Delawares actually agreed to it, what the Europeans then did or William Penn's children did was send three of their fastest runners to run diagonally across that territory to the point where they got uh, at least three times as much land as they thought they would. Originally, uh, the Lenape people of that area thought that they were going to give around 400 or 4,000 acres or 400 acres, and they ended up giving about 1,200 square miles of land. And so that is what eventually became the colony of Pennsylvania. Another thing to note uh, here is that the Delaware are, uh, were actually removed several times. Uh, there, were, there are nations like the Cherokee and the Seminole that were only moved once from where the, from their uh, ancestral homelands in uh, the Southeast to Oklahoma, where they are Indian country where they reside. The Delaware, the Lenape were removed several times. And you can see in the upper right corner, a map of the different uh, phases of removal. Basically the United States government would promise them land west, directly west of where they were with another indigenous tribe. And then later, would come and say, we actually want this land, you all need to move again. In spite of that legacy, the Lenape were able to maintain their cultural ways, were able to maintain many of their dialects, and were able to maintain as well their sovereignty as a nation, which very few nations were able to do, especially nations on the East Coast. And so, uh, Recently, the rematriation of Lenape Hoking or the rematriation of Lenape ancestral lands has uh, picked up pace because of this return to the sort of original relations. Um, some good news is that in 2018, that's actually a typo here, in 2018, after more than 300 years, the Lenape people were able to hold a powwow on their ancestral land in southern Manhattan. Uh, what's also true, uh, here's a picture of it actually, is that uh, green corn, which is, or black black corn, I'm sorry, say sopping in the Lenape dialect, uh, is now sprouting and growing on the island of Manahata for the first time in more than 200 years as well. 
And so these are all evidences and examples of rematriation, as we call it. Um, re the re the, there are two reasons to use matriation here. Um, one of them, excuse me, one of them is that uh, the Lenape people are matrilineal. And so uh, there's nothing to, there's, there's no sort of uh, fatherland to, to return things to, right? Uh, the Lenape people in many ways think of the earth as a, a mother um, and as the person who determines their, their role in tribe and clan, et cetera. And so to return to the right relations, to return to a relationship with a sovereignty, political sovereignty, to right the colonial relationship and end the colonial relationship with the United States government and to return the land to its uh, caregivers, uh, its rightful caregivers, is the definition that many indigenous people are thinking of for rematriation. And we see here a quotation from uh, another indigenous person on the African continent, Bernadette Moutine, uh, who's the director of Engender South Africa, where she defines uh, rematriation. And so I've always really loved this quotation from Joy Harjo's An American Sunrise. Uh, it says, we are still America. We know the rumors of our demise. We spit them out. They die soon. Joy Harjo is Muscogee Creek. Uh, the Muscogee Creek are a people whose ancestral homelands are uh, in the Alabama, Georgia, and Florida areas. And so, and she is the first uh, poet laureate. She's the first Native American woman poet laureate of the United States. I love this quotation because it reminds me of George Jackson, who was the uh, field marshal for the Black Panther Party. He said something very similar in his book, Blood in My Eye. So uh, what I would love now is uh, for everyone to go to the link that Emmy has dropped in the chat here. If you go to that link, nativeland.ca, you can, with a certain amount of accuracy, uh, type in your where you are, the name of your town, the name of your area of your city, and you can see the uh, the land or the territory or the uh, the, the territory of which indigenous people uh, you are in. And so, what I would love is if folks can just uh, type that in and then shout out the indigenous nations uh, whose territory you are currently occupying. One of the reasons to do this, beyond the fact uh, that there are so many of us, right, <laughs> is that if any of us are in the Western Hemisphere or Australia out, or Aotearoa, New Zealand, for example, then many of us are occupying indigenous land with a colonial relationship. And so it's important to recognize that as the basis of our racial hierarchy and the basis of our racial construct as we know it. It was created to rationalize or to give reason to this theft and the policies of murder that uh, allowed that theft to continue and sustain itself over time. I also look forward to the time in the future when that colonial relationship ends. And so it's also then necessary for us to talk about indigenous people using the past, present and future tense because it is, uh, because Lenape people have been able to uh, maintain their sovereignty and their ways of life throughout these policies of displacement and will continue and grow and wake and awake and reawaken some of their ancestral uh, habits and rituals as well uh, once the colonial relationship with the government is dissolved and once the United States no longer has control over these areas. So we're not going to move forward and act as if like, oh, here's the land acknowledgement and then here's the real stuff. We're going to continue to to, 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 to think about this as the basis of the knowledge that we are, that I'm creating or that we are creating today. And so I want us to move forward and listen to another, uh, to a native woman uh, in person or directly. Uh, she's not Lenape, uh, she's Anishinaabe. Uh, she maybe doesn't need introduction, but I'll introduce her anyway. Um, and so in order to frame the what, why, and how of what we're going to be doing today. And so Winona Leduc, is a uh, white earth Anishinaabe. Uh, she used to be a chief, I believe, within that uh, tribe and on that territory. Uh, she is an activist, a writer. Uh, she ran for president, uh, vice president, 
Uh, and a fun fact about that actually is that she's the only candidate of the Green Party ever to win an electoral vote in the United States. And that was in 2016. So I'm going to um, just play a clip of her and then I'm going to continue after that. Apologies, everyone. Anyone hearing this? Wonderful. How about now? Ani nindo ay maganaduk ng gagawig to magas binasikwe dugo makwa ndo dam kau babani kagish kani ganing nunjba miguich. Greeting you in Ojibwe as you probably gathered a language from this Oma'a king here. And I'm uh, thanking you very much for the honor of being here. I'm telling you I'm from White Earth up north, my reservation. I'm calling you my relatives. I, I wanted to start like that because I thought about uh, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, which is that food for us comes from our relatives, whether they have wings or fins or roots. And indeed, that is how we consider food. Food has a culture. It has history, it has stories, it has relationships that tie us to our food. Food is more than something you just buy at the store, something that just doesn't have a stamp on it. In our community, we are told long time ago by our prophets, our Anishinaabeg people lived on the eastern seaboard, and uh, we were related to those people out there, the Wampanoags and others, and we were instructed by our prophets that we should follow a shell which appeared in the sky. And in following that shell, we would arrive at the place where the food grows upon the water. And that food that grows upon the water is monomen, or wild rice. So we were instructed by the Creator to move here, Oma'a came to this place. And our wild rice, our monomen, is our most sacred food. It is a food that is first food given to a child when they can eat solid. It is last food before you pass into the spirit world. It is for all our, our feasts and all our ceremonies. It is very important to us. And we, we, as you know, we fought hard and long to keep our rice and to, and to keep it good. This is a, a picture of uh, Nakomas and Nana Buju. That's uh, our spirit beings from who we descend, uh, making wild rice. And this is my community today do pretty much the same thing as we did for a thousand years. We've got an aluminum canoe now instead of a birch bark. Hard to get trees that size these days. But uh, we still rice. And then the month that is called Monoma K Gizes, wild rice making moon, August into September, you'll see our people go out on the lakes. And we feel a great joy when we go out there with our two sticks in a canoe, go out there and harvest the rice. Sometimes it's uh, tall or short or fat or skinny or looks like a bottle brush, or looks all punked out. It's diverse. And that's how uh, we, we can keep it, because when a wind comes through, it blows off some of the rice. It doesn't blow off other rice. There's great diversity, you know, in that. We still parch it the same way over a fire. You can dance on your rice and your new moccasins, and do pretty much the same thing for all these years. And that defines us as Anishinaabe people. Our story of our relationship to food is similar to Thank you, everyone. So the reason I showed this is because I think it's very, very important for us to also take indigenous ways of understanding and ways of being as the origin and the foundation for the knowledge that we're going to be building about race and the gender binary. It is no accident that the diversity that Winona LaDuke is referring to is also thought of as a, an an asset for resilience for her and her people, right? And so that is one of the main theses, right? Or hypotheses or ideas that I'm going to be having today. It is really not super difficult. It is that biodiversity and gender diversity are one and the same thing. That gender diversity is merely one expression of human diversity and that this sort of gender diversity 
actually creates a human species that is more resilient over time. That actually, what if we, instead of thinking like many conservatives do as trans and gender non-conforming people as like a harbinger or a bringer of societal collapse as an infection or a stain on our society, what if instead we truly admitted actually that healthy ecosystems produce trans and gender non-conforming people and that uh, trans and gender non-conforming people contribute to healthy, sustainable ecosystems of the human species. And so that is an idea that we're going to come back to again and again throughout the day. I swear I'm going to keep coming back to it because I'm going to keep hammering it home. If it sounds really abstract now, hopefully it will sound less abstract by the end of our, our time together. Here are the goals of our webinar. So one is to discuss how racial hierarchies have evolved over time through gender violence. Uh, what is true is that uh, racism and white supremacy in order to be instituted required just a ton of violence against people and a lot of that was gender violence. Second, we're gonna hear stories of African indigenous people who resisted colonialism and the gender binary about 400 years, starting about 400 years before Stonewall. That just so happens to be uh, the time that Europeans started to sort of uh, impose <laughs> their gender categories and their gender cultures on the rest of the world. And we'll talk a little bit about how, why that happened. And then we don't wanna stay in some of the, uh, we don't wanna pretend just as we do with African indigenous people that trans and gender non-conforming people only resist in the past and only exist in the past and the present. So we want to also envision ways of being and doing beyond what I'm calling and what lots of people are calling the colonial gender binary. But beforehand, uh, I wanna introduce myself. <laughs> so my name is Malcolm Shanks. Uh, I use they and he pronouns interchangeably. Uh, for uh, those who don't know, that would sound like uh, if you were talking about me, but not uh, using my name in a sentence, you might say something like Malcolm went to the store and then he bought ice cream and then they ate the ice cream before they got to the counter. So he had to hand the cashier an empty wrapper to ring up. That would be how you would talk about me. Some people just use their names, but I use the name interchangeably. So I am deeply, deeply excited to be here and so nervous <laughs> um, to be talking to you all about this subject that's been so important to me and that I've been working on so for so long, actually. Um, so I think in 2014, uh, I was doing, I've been a facilitator uh, doing social justice work uh, and then and an organizer for about uh, 15 years now, and I've uh, been doing that facilitation for just as long, right? And so in 2015, after years and years of doing, uh, you know, trans ally trainings and racism 101 trainings and imperialism trainings, et cetera, et cetera, right? I finally started to put all of that stuff together in my head because we were doing a trans ally training for a group of South Asian youth. Uh, and so me and uh, my co-facilitator were like, why don't we just actually tailor it to brown and black people? How about we do that? We don't pretend that to be trans is to have a white or a middle-class experience, but instead come from the understanding that there are many different genders, many different cultures, and many different ways that those cultures understand gender. And so uh, we started with the question, how did the whole world even get to genders, right? How did this idea even come to our understanding? And so uh, since then, it's led me in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, I should go back a little bit further. Um, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. That is where I am from. Uh, I still have a 202 number and a D.C. ID. It's so important to me. Uh, the thing that, uh, and that's also in a coach tonk, it's got away land and territory, uh, if we're talking about the non-colonial names of that land. And so one thing that I saw all around me was patterns, patterns in who was allowed there, who was allowed where, uh, patterns in uh, why my neighborhoods never seemed to have, the neighborhoods that I lived in never seemed to have enough, why the neighborhoods that I would go to for extracurricular activities or to go to the museum or to learn things always seem to have too much. Why when there are, when it's supposedly the nation's capital and one of the richest countries on earth, 
that no matter whether a Republican or a Democrat is in president, is president, the hood kind of always looks the same, right? And so these are questions that I had a lot growing up, a lot growing up. I was really lucky to grow up in a community of people, shout out to my mama, who told me the truth when I was asking questions and who also went out of their way to educate me about the patterns that they also saw in the world. And a lot of times those patterns included white supremacy and racism. What I didn't get pointed out a lot though, uh, was the many trans and gender non-conforming and queer black people who were around me all the time, who all those deeply politicized black people kept telling me were not a part of our community, were not a part of our history, and were not a part of our identity. And so that in many ways was some of the inspiration that I had for this uh, project. I'm most certainly not the only one to ask these questions, uh, but I'm hoping that some of the answers that I've come up with will be helpful to you all. So I'm really excited to dive right in. So here are some of the words that we'll be using today. Please don't log out immediately. I swear I'm not going to be using all of them in a row. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to get them all on a screen for you all, just in case there's any uh, confusion about some of the words. Like there's a lot of isms and, you know, three and four syllable words that have been used to have this conversation when in reality, as we said right earlier, it's not that complicated. The idea that the diversity of our species uh, is an asset, you know? And so there are a couple that I want to pull out and name for us. And there's one that I am that I missed that I missed that I also want to name here. So a couple of them that I'll be using. We're going to define imperialism later, so I'm going to leave that. Um, capitalism. Capitalism is a sort of global system uh, right now where people use money to produce more money instead of, for example, using uh, their labor to produce goods that other people can use. It's a system that's based on using the labor of people who do work to produce money that then will produce more money over time. So it makes rich people who have money richer because they already have money and people who work and do not have money less wealthy over time. Uh, Neo-colonialism is one that I do also want to talk about or colonialism generally. Uh, a col colonialism is what we saw uh, during the land acknowledgement when the Dutch took that tiny little portion of land and then suddenly it became more and more and more, right? Colonialism is when people travel to a place that they are not from and settle there. Sometimes, uh, and in the context of colonialism, it's usually about the power relationship. Many people migrate and travel, but not all people impose their ways of being their laws and their realities on the lands that they come to. And so when that happens, we call it colonialism. When the people who have that system imposed on them are able to somehow free themselves or free their land, and, uh, but the world system that created colonialism and that maintains it is still in place, i.e. capitalism, <laughs> then we call that neocolonialism. A great example of that uh, is when, for example, um, Cuba fights to free itself from the uh, colonialism of Spain or the Spanish and then comes very quickly into the sphere of influence and starts selling the same things that they used to sell for a, a low price. They start selling those things to the United States. The same people who were uh, enslaved and working to grow sugar and make rum for the Spanish were being paid almost nothing or still enslaved to send things to the United States instead. Instead, the only difference was that now Cuba was no longer technically a property of Spain, right? And so in name only, countries are able to achieve their freedom and yet are still indebted or are still uh, in some ways enslaved to a world system that sees them and their people as inferior. And uh, patriarchy is one that I also wanted to name here. It is a system, uh, it comes from the Greek of a rule by the father. And so I want to name that patriarchy is a world system in which all men are empowered to make rules and make culture and to determine what all women and people who are not men do. 
but I also want to name that patriarchy is uh, a class institution as well. And what I mean by that is that patriarchy concentrates power in the hands of, of very few men who then create a culture where all men think they share in that power by, because they can oppress people who are not men. Uh, another thing I wanted to say is BIPOC, that stands for Black and Indigenous People and People of Color. Lots of people uh, have named the necessity for us to actually pull out the, the relationships that Black people have in the two United States and Canada and Cuba and Venezuela and all sorts of nations where they were enslaved in the Western Hemisphere and beyond. And then obviously also then Indigenous people also have a very specific political relationship to the United States, to Canada, and to other nations uh, that politically have gotten rid of their ability to run their own affairs. And so, and then people of color is an umbrella term uh, that we are often using for politics. And so the last one that I wanna name here is ableism that is not here. That is in this, that's gonna come up again. <laughs> and so that's why I wanted to name it. Ableism is the idea uh, is a culture of oppression and exploitation whereby um, people who are not uh, able to function according to how society decides they should are thought of as lesser than, uh, that bodies that are not shaped like the norm of what those people decide should be the norm of humans are thought of as less than. Those people are thought of and um, uh, are, are treated as if they are incapable of doing things or incapable of participating in society. And then there's a lot of violence that comes from devaluing people because of what they can and cannot do for uh, work, right? And so ableism uh, will come up because the way that people are shaped uh, and the way that they move their bodies in many ways is determined, is, is determined to be uh, bad for society. And so in, in, in that, in many ways, also applies to transphobia and antagonism against trans people because they and we are also told that we are not using our bodies correctly, that we are not moving them correctly, and that they are not shaped correctly. And so there's a lot of overlaps between what we will be talking about as transphobia today and ableism. Thank you. Someone also mentioned there's also the major overlap because continuing today, but for a long history, uh, gender nonconformity or ne being gender nonconforming or choosing not to uh, participate in the gender norms of society was also then thought of as evidence of mental illness and mental unfitness. And so there's also a devaluing of people in our society generally uh, because they are thought to not have the brain capacity or brain functioning of uh, the people who are making those rules and who have that power. And so they also devalue those people because of the ways that their brains work. So why race and? This is, these are a couple of reasons, right? <laughs> but I also want to name, it centralizes race explicitly without focusing on race exclusively. You know, we have different social locations. Uh, and we also have different intersecting issues in our lives. We don't live single issue lives, as Audre Lorde says. And so it also allows for clear, clear and nuanced analysis of domination and exploitation. It can break down false conflicts so that we can build stronger coalitions. And it also allows us to consider the full complex personhood of Black and Indigenous people of color. But I also want to name that Race Forward did not invent race and as a concept, and that race and is not a new concept either. Uh, a lot of people have heard of the term of intersectionality. Uh, a lot of people have heard the term intersectionality. It was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is the co-founder of the African American Policy Forum. It was coined by her in 1989. However, the idea of intersectionality has a very, very long history. And so I wanna do just a little bit of uh, acknowledgement of the intellectual labor uh, that has come into creating the idea of intersectionality. So one of the first times uh, that I can, that just stretching back, I'm sure that one could go to folks like Phyllis Wheatley, for example, 
<laughs> for even further back in the 1700s and early 1800s to talk about the the concept of the idea that one doesn't just one isn't just black one isn't just a woman one isn't just one thing at a time but one actually inhabits multiple ways of being and multiple identities at the same time sojourner truth at the women rights Con women's rights convention in akron ohio in 1851 had to intervene in a moment that she thought of as not only racist, but also patriarchal, but also sexist, right? And so in that moment, what she said, it was, it was uh, immortalized in many ways, the famous Ain't I a Woman speech. Uh, but we should also name that she actually didn't say Ain't I a Woman. That was some random white dude who was like, she must talk like this because she's black. I would really encourage people to, to check out the Sojourner Truth Project.org to see the true history and the true, um, transcript of that actual speech, a Sojourner Truth said it, a woman who worked to educate herself in spite of it being illegal would not have, uh, or did not in that moment, I wouldn't say would not, did not in that moment choose to speak up and not use perfect English in order to communicate with the white abolitionists around her. And so when she said, am I not a woman? What she was naming was that there were contradictions in whiteness in the ways that they treated women and in the ways that they were talking about women, because the ways that they were talking about women were none of the ways that she had been treated as a slave. She said, I have worked just as long as any man. I have been sent out to the fields to work just as long and hard as any man, and no one's ever at, called me dainty, no one's ever called me delicate, no one's ever helped me out of a coach, you know? And so she's naming the hypocrisy of a gender system that doesn't really hold up when we consider race. Ida B. Wells did a very similar thing in the late 1800s. Uh, she is uh, one of the reasons that she is famous uh, is because she was able to create a strong coalition against anti against lynching in the South and against sexual violence against black women. One of the ways that she did that was by naming both she was she named sexual violence against black women as a form of racial terror under Jim Crow. And she also named lynching as a form of sexual violence that maintained the color line in the South during this time. Claudia Jones uh, came to New York uh, from Trinidad in the early 1900s, uh, or early to mid 1900s, and she was a uh, long-standing member of the Communist Party. Uh, she, I love this quotation. <laughs> she, in, the, in an end to the neglect of the problems of Negro women, writes, the capitalists know far better than many progressives seem to, seem to know that once Negro women undertake action, the militancy of the whole Negro people and thus of the anti-imperialist coalition is greatly enhanced. It's also worth noting that the political, one of the political organizations that she founded with other Black women was called Sojourners for Truth. Then we have Frances Beale, who was uh, the co-founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee generally, uh, one of the organizations that basically desegregated the United States, but specifically the South in the Black Freedom Summer of the 1960s, mid-1960s. She wrote Black Women's Manifesto or Double Jeopardy to be Black and Female. That was uh, originally published as a pamphlet in 1969 and then uh, was eventually published as part of an, an, in an anthology by Tony K. Bambara, another famous black feminist author who we'll be talking about later uh, in her Black Women Anthology. We have the Combahee River Collective in 1979 who were organizing mostly against the disappearance of black women in the uh, Boston area and Mashpee Wampanoag territory and the lack of any attention that anyone was paying uh, black organ mainstream black organizations were not paying attention to this. Uh, women's organizations and feminist organizations in the late 1970s were not paying attention. And so they began to organize in behalf, on behalf of themselves, right? And so they specifically in their statement of purpose or in their statement, well now famous Combahee River Collective statement, uh, talked about the need to consider people as not merely raceless or sexless workers, but to always consider that workers have a race, have a sex, have a sexuality. And then uh, there is Angela Davis in this line as well, who in Women in Capitalism wrote, 
the objective compression of black women in America has a class and also a national character. Because the structures of female oppression are inextricably tethered to capitalism, female emancipation must be simultaneously and explicitly the pursuit of black liberation and of the freedom of other nationally oppressed peoples, right? And so we are seeing two centuries of a really long idea. All of this was written before Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality in a, in a law journal article in 1989, but she also stands in a legacy of Black women who have been organizing for themselves for the past 200 years in order to bring communities together to advocate for true freedom from multiple uh, versions and dimensions of, of the oppression of Black women. And so the reason <laughs> that all of this is so relevant, not only because we are indebted to them for the language that they uh, have given us to have these conversations, uh, it's also because many of the Black women who were fighting for their freedom faced uh, constant antagonism and faced constant barriers and, uh, from the gender binary itself. Here's a story actually that I wanna tell. It's from uh, 18, when is it? 58, right? And so Sojourner Truth is at an anti-slavery meeting in northern Indiana, and a rumor was spread uh, among the pro-slavery people that she was actually a, quote, man disguised in women's clothing. And so when it actually became an uproar and somebody said, how dare you? And she said, how dare you ask me this? What reason do you have to question my gender publicly? when I'm just speaking, it's because he said, you are too out, you are too strongly spoken. You, team, you seem too strong to be my idea of a woman, right? And so in that way, fighting for freedom over time has always been thought of as something that makes you subvert or fight against gender norms, especially for women and people who are not men who are fighting against their subjugation and violence and violence against them by patriarchy to not identify with the gender that you are assigned in slavery or in an oppressive system is, a matter, is as a matter of fact, way more common than trans people and gender nonconforming people. Gender norms are not politically or racially neutral. Women like Sojourner Truth were not fighting to be white women. They were fighting to free black women from oppression. And they frequently criticized the contradictions and the, and the different, uh, hypocrisies that were present in white gender norms and categories. Here are a couple of other examples from very, very recently about the contradictions and the hypocrisies of white gender norms. One is the fact that in France right now, face coverings, if you are a Muslim woman, are banned. Face coverings in order to protect people from COVID-19 are required by law. The contradictions are endless. Right. Here's another one uh, when uh, that they act that the International Olympic Committee actually for the first time chose to define what a woman was in order to stop Castor Semenya from beating the white women around her as badly as she did. And so and now we're back to Tony K. Bambara, who in the Black Woman Anthology also talks about uh, black feminism needing to also submerge all breezy definitions of manhood and womanhood until realistic definitions emerge through a commitment to blackhood. What she's saying, what she's saying here in my interpretation is that manhood and womanhood have, as a matter of fact, never served black people. <laughs> they have harmed black people consistently throughout time that that uh, manhood and womanhood are standards that black people have been excluded from and that when we have chosen to fight for our freedom, uh, many times it's been through the ideas of manhood, being a full man, being a full woman, and yet those have not fully served to actually free us in this time, right? We can now admit in this moment, 2020, <laughs> I guess 60 years beyond the time when uh, the kind of I am a man phrase is being used, right? I am a full man, that actually that was not quite a complete political vision for black freedom. And that is not to disrespect our ancestors. They, in many ways, and elders, they did the original work to bring us to this point, right? It is to say that they also were not, were not, were thinking about the many contradictions 
uh, that were caused by their own thinking and their own organizing at that time. And so there are some facts to establish here. One, there are no such things as male genes or female hormones or male body. Those are inventions of ableism, here that word comes back, because the idea is that these genes, hormones, and bodies are supposed to be doing things based on the gender that scientists assume us to have. That when they see, that when they see people that they think of as men or think should be men, they have said, oh, you have your genes, which are the same genes, overwhelmingly, we're talking overwhelmingly is in 100%, <laughs> the same genes as women or as people who are not male, and that to say, oh, your genes are entirely created to make you male because male is the sum total of your identity to me right now. They say the same thing about hormones, even though all humans have some balance of hormones like progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone, they are consistently referred to commonly as male hormones and female hormones, as if men don't, as if men, people who identify as men or people who are, as if men don't have testosterone and women, as if men don't have estrogen and progesterone and as if women don't have testosterone. Never been true, never will be. Also, there's no such thing as a male body because in order to do that, you would have to line up every single human in the world, <laughs> ask them how they identify, and then create some sort of pattern out of that. To my knowledge, no scientist has ever been able to achieve that. Instead, what they have done are make assumptions based on their political view of how society should be. Another fact to establish is that intersex people or people who are born uh, with uh, uh, sex characteristics that we think of as not exclusively male or female, those people are just as common as people with green eyes or red hair. As in many systems of oppression, the reason that folks are treated as rarities or abnormalities is because of power, because of power relations. And we can define those as ableism, the idea that, uh, gen that you're supposed to have one sex because that's the best way to do what you're supposed to do as a human, which is reproduce heterosexually. So we can see uh, that the false expectation for how humans always use their bodies is both a symptom of ableism and patriarchy. The other thing to say here is that transgender people are not new. <laughs> transgender people have existed throughout time before the word transgender existed, before the English language existed. Transphobia is also more than a moral failure. It is a structure. We have some uh, statistics here that show us that in spite of transgender people getting supposedly more accepted, more common, despite uh, society progressing over the many years, that violence against trans people and the social exclusions that cause poverty, unemployment, and other uh, kinds of um, oppression, right, uh, that those continue to this day. Um, that as a matter of fact, if we look across gender categories, that patriarchy continues to have structural and systemic impacts that impoverish people who are not men uh, within the ca within capitalist economies, right? And so, to break to break that down, um, that simply means that trans people are being discriminated against uh, because the structures of society operate naturally and systematically without any intent from people, even though there's a lot of transphobic intent and intent to harm trans people in our world. Ending transphobia means that we don't need to just be nice to each other or accept people for who they are. It also means that we need to fight the systems that have actually created transphobia and maintain it in our world. And so now we're gonna talk about what some of those systems are. So, before we do that, uh, we have to, again, define imperialism. My apologies, everyone. <laughs> my phone, my doorbell is ringing. So I'm going to continue speaking. Hopefully it won't interrupt too much. So there are some, uh, this is a map of the countries in the world that have been under European control. As we can see, almost every single nation almost all of the land on earth has been either under European control or considered part of Europe. It's kind of wild how Europe goes all the way to the Pacific Ocean when white people draw the maps. We also can see that the United States inherited 
that legacy of going to other places and not minding one's business. This is a map of every, and, and the red is every single country that the United States has ever been at war with or invaded. So we are talking about a global system that has impacted everyone in the world, regardless of where we sit and regardless of whether race as a construct exists in our, nas in our nation, right? So I want us to do a little poll here to talk about what is imperialism. So the poll is gonna be, where is our clothing made? So what I want you to do is to look inside of your clothing and to look at a tag inside of your clothing. Many of us have tags unless our stuff is homemade. And that tag on that tag will say made in, I have a top that is made in Turkey, right? And so I'm going to release a poll here that should be coming up on your screen. And what I would like for you to do is to vote in the poll, the world region or continent or the countries in uh, where your top, your pants, your dress, your skirt, et cetera, was made, right? And we're gonna see, I'm gonna keep this open for like 30, 40 seconds here. Apologies. It takes way more than 40 seconds to look at a tag in your clothing sometimes. So I'm going to keep it open for longer than 40 seconds. So <laughs> I'm going to keep it open for another 40 seconds from now, probably. So we'll keep it open for another until we get to a minute and a half. Sorry, everybody. I hope nobody was rushing. <laughs> I'm seeing here, if you don't, uh, some of them are not named countries, right? And so if, the, if, the, if your country is not named, go ahead and just put it in the world, put it in one of the world regions that are close to it. Um, for example, um, I'm seeing Honduras was named. So I would, I, would, I would personally put that in the Mexico, the Caribbean and Central America portion. All right, I'm gonna end the polling in another 10 seconds here. Excellent. So here is, here are the results <laughs> of a group of three, about 300 totally random people. The vast majority of our clothing is made in South Asia and Southeast Asia, a full 41%. And I know that might actually not be a surprise to people, but that is not a natural, uh, that is not a natural economy in the world, right? It's not natural that, there, that, the, that this section of the world produces such a vast majority and holds such a high majority of the low wage factories and the low wage jobs. And that is a function of imperialism. It concentrates power in the hands of very few Europeans who basically shaped the entire world such that the factories that, that produce the goods that they want would not impact them negatively by being close to them. And one of the ways that they did that was by taking over other countries and by shaping their politics and their economies such that they would produce cheap goods for people who exist in the countries of Europe the United States and other global north countries, as we call them, right? Another word for global north is imperialist countries. <laughs> uh, we simply don't we simply don't name that because we don't always want to call people thieves to their faces. And so, when we are thinking of the definition of imperialism, it is oftentimes referred to as uh, the policy and practice of forming and maintaining an empire in seeking to control raw materials and world markets by the conquest of other countries, the establishment of colonies, et cetera. And so what does this have to do with gender? <laughs> I wanna tell a story here. I was, um, 
There, one of my favorite authors and academics is this uh, Yoruba Nigerian woman, Oyeronke Oyewumi. And so I got the opportunity to hear her speak. Um, oh, it's funny. I was talking to the interpreters before this started, and I was like, I'm not going to give any book recommendations that aren't already in the presentation. That was a lie. I apologize. So uh, she wrote a brilliant book. She's written many books. One of them is called The Invention of Women about how gender, about how Western gender, gender categories arrived among the Yoruba of Nigeria, the Yoruba people of Nigeria and Cameroon. And so she told this story about how men, uh, Yoruba men specifically, would be telling her that it's traditional that men wear the pants in the Yoruba family. Her response to that is, and when did you start wearing pants? Pants are a European Western invention. So what kind of phrasing were people using to talk about the natural power that men should have over everyone else before pants were brought and spread or even invented? Another couple of examples of that are the fact that pink was originally, or uh, in the 1920s at least, was actually thought of as a masculine color and blue was thought of as a feminine color. Uh, in, there's another picture here. Uh, this is from the 80s in Iran. It's a piece of propaganda or a pamphlet actually uh, about women in Iran from the early Islamic Republic in the 1980s. And so the thing that the uh, Farsi down here at the bottom is saying is that they're highlighting based on how people dress in those nations, what that society prizes about those women. And so they're, they're, they're trying to make the point that because women in the United States are never covered, that uh, their bodies are what are prized. That, uh, that because their arms are not covered in the, United, in the Soviet Union, that their labor or their work is the only thing that's prized for women. And then they're making the point that in the Islamic Republic, women are asked to cover up uh, in order that the society prioritize what is in their brains and in their hearts, uh, a possibly feminist message depending on how it's used and who is using it. So of course, race and empire would be involved in the gender norms and expectations changing across time. Now I'm gonna go into a quick non-binary people are not new. This is the extended remix edition. So this is gonna go a little bit quickly, uh, but you're not meant to gather all of this information. If you're interested, feel free to just grab a, a little tidbit and do more of uh, research. So I wanna start off here with creator, creator deities. So on three different continents that I can identify at least, Creator deities are either bi-gender, androgynous, or have multiple genders. At the top, we have Mawulisa, who is the creator deity of the phone people, who are also famous for inventing Bodun. So they are in Benin. Mawulisa is a bi-gender deity, has masculine energies and feminine energies, masculine aspects and feminine aspects. Also in South Asia, there is uh, Adha Nareshwara, and so that is a, a composite deity of the feminine aspect of power, Shakti, and the masculine aspect of power, Purusha, represented by the gods Shiva and Parvati, who are also consorts for one another. But at times, they also are represented as one person with two sexes or genders. And then on the bottom left, on the bottom right here, we have a drawing uh, from the uh, Aztec Florentine Codex of Ometeot, who is the uh, Nahuatl god of um, duality of creation and is also thought to have a masculine and feminine aspect. So now we can get to real people, right? <laughs> so let's acknowledge the fact that these societies all think when they think about fertility and creation, that they think of bi-gender, androgynous, and intersex people. We should just name that, right? The Cheyenne and the Arapaho also have bi-gender or intersex deities uh, that, that are creators for them. So we're talking three different continents. This is a quotation uh, from Juan de la Bandera's uh, notes uh, during Juan Pardo's uh, expedition to Cherokee and Catawba territories uh, during the 1500s. And so what's notable here is not only that they in the 1500s saw 
uh, people who might refer to themselves as two spirit now or people who are not binary, were not identified as men or women in the way, as cis men or cis women in the way that we do today, but also that the cacique or the chief, as the Spanish referred to him, um, replied that the Indian was his brother. Now, I don't know whether that means biological according to our patrilineal or our kinship structures, whether that means that they were directly came from the same parents. What it means is that the chief said, this is my people. They said, what's that person over there doing? And the cacique said, this is my people, you know, and then explained to them why that was happening in 1567. This is a drawing of a person who was called uh, Kimbanda in Central Africa or Jinbanda. It was painted by an Italian monk. So a Catholic <laughs> went to the courts of Angola in Central Africa in the 1600s and even, even he could not avoid drawing non-binary people. It's also worth noting that he was in the royal court of Queen Njinga, who might better be referred to actually as a king. She herself did not dress or present herself in the ways that we think of as cis womanhood. She had an entire harem of people who she dressed all of them, regardless of their shape and gender as women, because they were her wives. And then uh, during the time of photography, actually, the British were then when they uh, were photographing uh, in colonial South Asia or, uh, or in colonial India, they photographed Hidra, which is a gender group in South Asia. They were forced onto a registry and then legally outlawed by the British Criminal Tribes Act in 1871. And so uh, it's also true that uh, in the main epic of, uh, or one of the main epics of the Hindu religion, uh, the Mahabharata, that Arjun, one of the warriors of the main families in that epic was also cursed by a goddess, I believe, or by a deity uh, to be a eunuch for uh, a few years or a portion of his lifetime. And so uh, Hydra and eunuchs as well in South Asia have a thousand year history uh, that stretches back long before colonialism and long before transgender is a word. Colonizers violently suppressed any ways of being that they didn't like. Often the first people to be affected by this kind of violence were people who didn't match European understandings of men and women. So when they would arrive in places, they would say, you are not doing what we think that you should be doing. And so uh, we are going to uh, end your life for it. And so that is why one of the main ways that transphobia was created by colonization is through warfare, the actual warfare through which conquest happened. And so the first instance that I have been able to come across of colonial violence that was all, it is also an instance of transphobic violence, interestingly enough. In 1513, Vasco Nunez de Balboa was traveling through what's now the Isthmus of Panama looking for what people were calling the South Sea. Or uh, he eventually, uh, quote unquote, discovered the Pacific Ocean. And so people uh, build lots of monuments and parks and name cities after him. But what is also true is that he was a violent mass murderer. Uh, in 1513, he was traveling through the Isthmus of Panama when he discovered the village of Cuarequa he actually had already murdered the leader of that village before he entered the village. But when he entered the village, what he found was a society in which uh, people were not held to the same gender expectations as the conquistadores were used to in Spain. And so he uh, identified that as sinful, as demonic, etc. And then in one of the most famous uh, piece in one of the most famous instances of violence in violence in the Americas threw 40 unarmed indigenous people to be torn to pieces by dogs. And one of the more famous paintings uh, of the conquest of the conquistadores uh, related by Peter Martyr in Decades in the New World is uh, a depiction of that scene. It's called, uh, I think, The Dogs Eat the Sodomites or something like that. And so trigger warning, I'm about to show that image to you all. What is also true is that gender expression was legislated, stratified, and segregated racially in colonial societies for everyone. 
An example that I have for that is the Tinya laws in colonial New Orleans. And so uh, colonial New Orleans in the late 1700s, like the 1790s, was Spanish and then for a bit I was French mostly, and then for a bit Spanish, and then the French got it back and sold it to the United States. That's kind of the history. One of the things that uh, the Spanish governor did while he, for the short time that he was there, was create a law that said that Black women cannot wear their hair openly in public. They have to wrap it up under a scarf or a tignon in French. And so the tignon laws were laws that required black women to wrap their hair in public. Why? Because black women were so fly, basically, that they were getting so much attention, positive and negative in public, that the Spanish governor was uh, asked by the Spanish, by Spanish women to actually stop black women from adorning themselves freely in public. And these were free black women who were also subject to these laws. All black women were subject to these laws. And so, Right, to fly for the colonizers, because what Black women then chose to do was decorate their scarves. And so some of the most amazing headscarf and elaborate headscarf wrappings came from the Caribbean from this era. And, and, uh, and, and New Orleans was definitely part of the Caribbean and is part of the Caribbean because of the Tignan laws. And so Black women were resisting the many ways that they were told, you can't be women like these other women because either for reasons of competition for reasons of uh, making sure that people are understand themselves as less than. To, to situate people as less than requires legislating that they not be able to be like you, even in public, even when they are free, even when they are legally supposed to be considered just like you as citizens. What is also true is that Myths about the inferiority of colonized people were oftentimes attributed to their inability to do gender like white people in Europe. And so the lack of proper manhood and womanhood was evidence of savagery, of backwardness, of the devil, and evidence of the lack of humanity. And so these are some photos uh, that were used as before and after photos for the Carlisle Indian Residence School, and uh, Indian Residential School. And so the Indian Residential Schools um, were created out of the idea that one needs to turn indigenous people into proper men and women. Unfortunately, many indigenous societies, uh, besides the fact that they didn't want this, also were not binary societies. And so many uh, people who were not part of that binary system were forced to become men or women through the residential schools. And the residential schools themselves trained everyone to be men and women through extraordinarily violent, harmful, genocidal means to be proper men and women. So while some were excluded from society in this way, from being able to be men and women like others, others were forcefully assimilated as part of state tactics. And then the binary is also enshrined in laws that were used to prosecute, prosecute people. Folks were demonized, ridiculed, and excluded from society and ultimately erased. I want to tell the story of Vittoria Antonio here. Vittoria, uh, Vittoria was a person who was uh, kidnapped and sold in, the, in one of the slave ports of Benin in 1556 and came to Portugal during that time. And so what I want for everyone to think about is the fact that there were so many transgender and gender nonconforming people who were being kidnapped and sold by communities uh, that thought it would be more convenient uh, for them, uh, and that then those people were then form formally not allowed to be who they were on in, in wherever they went, right? That as a matter of fact, slavery involved a whole bunch of gender coercion that was not just along men and women lines. Vittoria arrived in Lisbon in 1556, and she promptly refused to wear any of the clothing that the guy who, who owned her, his name was Paulo Manriquez, um, he refused to wear any of the clothing that he gave her to wear because it was the clothing for a male slave, right? And so she dressed herself. She dressed in a waistcoat and uh, a, tur a white turban and a jacket and um, maybe even like a little corset thing and set, up to and, and set out to create a business for herself in Lisbon. And that business, uh, was uh, sex work. And so she actually was so popular that uh, men could be seen lining up around the block outside of her home. And she was international 
as well, because she operated that business not only in Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, but also in the Azores, which are islands off the coast of Africa. And so she was a jet setting entrepreneur in the 1500s. So the Portuguese Inquisition got wind of what she was doing, as well as the fact uh, that uh, she was then guilty of sodomy or uh, homosexuality, according to them. And so they captured her again, and they forced her to undress so that they could see uh, basically how her body was shaped. And they determined that her body was that of a man. And then she was sentenced to live the rest of her life in a cage. Uh, the interesting thing to name about Vitoria, though, is that when she is giving testimony about herself, she said that there are many people like her where she comes from in Benin. And she also said that she had a, uh, an understanding of her body as her own, right? That she had a special orifice that she used to please men called the Buraco, right? And that many people where she was from had this very special orifice, right? And so she's naming that there's a group of people who have a very specific way of understanding their bodies that was not, um, that Europeans simply didn't care about or that Europeans thought that they needed to eradicate. And so we see that the, that these Western standards have been imposed for what gender norms look like that those are usually based on the binary practices of the European middle, or middle, middle class, right? That in the context of the United States, those people have all, all been settlers. And then everyone who doesn't fit into that has been criminalized, has been demonized, has been thought of as ridiculous uh, for the ways that we move our bodies, for the ways that we use our bodies or don't use them, for the ways that we adorn our bodies, et cetera, right? And this has legacies all the way down to today. And so, uh, Maria Lugones uh, is a brilliant scholar uh, who has called this uh, system the coloniality of gender. Uh, for those of us who don't love the weightiness of that phrase, we could also call it the colonial gender binary, right? But definitely want to shout out Maria, Maria Lugones here. And so that is, in many ways, the system that we are now fighting against. When we name transphobia, the reason that the system continues to impact black and indigenous people so deeply continues to have the highest murder rates in places that are in countries that are uh, close to the what we call the capitalist core right countries that are countries like mexico and colombia and turkey and brazil is because of this colonial gender binary it's because the gender binary is not only meant to keep all people down who are not men but it is also meant to maintain the colonial racial hierarchy. So now, a little bit past what I wanted to, <laughs> I would love for us to take 10 minutes for questions. I would love for us to take 10 minutes for questions. And so uh, again, go ahead and use the Q&A function. And that is going to be the way that we are going to do this. Not long. I'm actually gonna, yeah. Um, Emmy has typed in um, one of the questions in the chat um, awesome. for you to answer. Great. I, got, I see the first one from Emmy. Can you talk about how non binary Black and Indigenous people of color risk appropriating Indigenous gender identities? Hmm. I think I would probably need to hear a little bit more. Okay. Oh, I actually am. Great, okay. So I think the risk of appropriating indigenous gender identities. I think as a black person in the African diaspora, it is difficult and almost impossible to appropriate that which belongs to the African diaspora. And African people, as I have named, are also indigenous. And so should really be clear that indigeneity is an international frame. So if we're talking about North America, though, like indigenous people in North America, the Pacific Islands, like the Western Hemisphere, for example, people who experienced European colonialism from 1492 onwards and were racialized as indigenous, I would say uh, that in uh, the legacy has been fought such that two-spirit people have survived so long over this time and has sustained themselves and then reawakened their movement 
in a, a gathering in 1992 when the term Two Spirit was invented uh, between indigenous activists from the United States and Canada, and I believe other places in the Western Hemisphere as well. And so uh, that is my understanding of the history of the term Two Spirit. And so if other people who are not from those groups, who are not members of nations, who are not self-identified as indigenous from the Americas, or even from North America or Turtle Island, choose to use that word, that is a, con that is, that is a conversation I would say for people to consider amongst themselves. But I would say that appropriating anybody's terminology from outside of their experience is always going to be a recipe for disaster. Uh, I see another question that says, as non-binary people in diaspora, how can we hold ourselves and others accountable as we seek connections to gender identities that colonialism has erased from our personal lives, but were and or remain recognized groups in the lands we know we are genealogically tied to? This is an extension of the earlier question. Thank you. And so in, the con in that context, I would say, uh, it, I, as a non-Indigenous person, <laughs> as a person who doesn't identify as part of an Indigenous community, this is very difficult for me to like answer, and so I really want to stay in my lane here, to be honest. The best way that I can think about it is to quote some folks who are like Adrian Keene, for example, who and uh, you know people who are part of Indigenous nations in North America, and the one thing they say is that if you want to be a part of a community, that you have to go and be a part of that community. You have to contribute. Harlan Pruden says that Two-Spirit is not just a gender identity, Two-Spirit is a role and a commitment to one's community. It's a role and a commitment to your nation. It's a role and a commitment to your people. And so one cannot simply say one is a thing or say one is Two-Spirit. Two-Spirit is just as much a practice and an action and an organizing tradition as it is an identity. Uh, let me continue. All right, here's another. If gender is a social construct, what does it mean when we say masculine and feminine energies and aspects, especially when we use these terms to describe people and ideas across time and space? Gender is a social construct. Masculine and feminine are social constructs. These are simply words that I'm using that um, are easy, I think, in my, in my mind um, and that have been used to describe different people uh, through time. Uh, I do believe there is a such thing as non-binary masculine energy and non-binary feminine energy, but it sounds like maybe that was in, in the context of talking about the uh, bi-gender deities who, have ma who represent masculine and feminine aspects of the universe. That's simply how those indigenous groups talk about them. Um, and so I'm sure if we were to, uh, we could find many different ways in English when they're explaining things to people who are not part of those groups, that's what I should say. And so I'm sure if we were able to speak with them in their languages right now, or if I were able to speak their languages to you right now, we might hear uh, a bit more nuance than masculine and feminine energy. For, for, for a deeper exploration of that, I would encourage people to check out uh, the work of a, a healer from West Africa, um, from Burkina Faso. Um, I will type his name and stuff in um, some resources that I send out to you all. but. Um, I believe he wrote, he wrote a book called A Ritual of Water. Um, and so he writes a lot about how masculine and feminine aspects are not necessarily, are not necessary for how we talk about gender and embodiment, but are simply metaphors, just like anything else that we don't have to hold people to. I hope that's, uh, someone asked, can you speak to the notion that two spirit is not a monolithic experience or term? So this is again, um, Y'all pulling me way outside my lane here. <laughs> so I gave, a, I gave uh, my understanding of the history that I've been able to learn about the term two-spirit as uh, an umbrella term um, by indigenous activists of Turtle Island. Um, there is a lot, two-spirit, however, is a uh, translation from one indigenous language of North America, and there are thousands of them. And so that means that there are thousands of nations that had to then retranslate to spirit back into their own languages, even though if there were people who were not 
identified as men or women in their societies that they would not have necessarily been thought of as having two spirits. Because again, that would be to say that there are two spiritual genders when we know that there are more than that, right? And so I don't think that two-spirit people are limiting themselves in any way. I don't want to say that ever. But what I do know is that there's a lot of disagreement among indigenous people uh, who are LGBTQ or who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender nonconforming, et cetera, and queer uh, about whether two-spirit is a traditional term, whether it should be used, and in what context. Uh, I'm seeing one more here. Can you talk a bit more about internalized transphobia in uh, BIPOC communities as a result of colonization and what healing could look like moving forward? I think I may save that. <laughs> I may save that because it, it, I, I'm, I want to, um, there's a section that actually addresses that here. What I will say uh, in terms of addressing internalized transphobia, what healing could look like moving forward, that, that part we can get to late, that part we, I have a little bit planned for, but internalized transphobia, I have so many theories about why violence against transgender people is so rampant in black and indigenous communities of color and, in, and, and communities of color. Um, I think uh, many trans and gender nonconforming and queer people all around the world are trying to all the time think about how we could be rejected by the people who raised us and how we could be rejected by the communities um, that are so under assault and that so need us, right? And so one of the theories that I have is that this legacy of violence, of extraordinary gender violence, of, of children being snatched away from their parents, of people making difficult decisions to sell off their relatives in certain cases in order to make money or to survive, uh, of people choosing to uh, limit who they are and their own gender expression to participate in a society that would have killed them otherwise. I think that there are really deep scars that have been covered over and papered up by our communities. And I'll speak to Black communities specifically in the United States. I think that there, I think there are many ways in which Black people see gender nonconformity or see non-binary and trans people and see a freedom that they fear. And I think uh, that that fear is psychological, but I also think it has to do with the fact that there are power interests in Black communities that also want to maintain patriarchal gender norms because they think that that is what civilization looks like for us in the long term. They think that black people are still not civilized and for us to become civilized, we need to tame our sexuality and our gender. And that one of the ways that we do that is by erasing trans and gender nonconforming people by, and by uh, making sure that we don't exist. And so I think that's one of, I think that is, I think that speaks to a couple of different reasons, right? One psychological, uh, that has to do with intergenerational trauma and one that has to do with material and political interests. Um, so thank you, everybody. We're gonna, I'm gonna move forward a little bit. Um, I'm gonna reshare my screen again. And we're going to continue. So in spite of this, <laughs> right, now we get to the, the, fun, the fun part, or more fun, in spite of this, there were people who refused to be confined by this binary. As a matter of fact, all we've been hearing is stories of people who refuse to be confined by this binary, whether it's Sojourner Truth, or Angela Davis, or Francis Beal, or Claudia Jones, or Ida B. Wells, or Vitoria, or uh, Two-Spirit Activists, right? And so I want to tell a few stories. All of these are from the African diaspora as well. Uh, from some of these different times. The first person is uh, Eleanor de Céspedes. Eleanor de Céspedes uh, was uh, a person who was a barber, uh, a surgeon, uh, operated as a nurse uh, in Spain in the 1500s. And so the thing about Eleanor 
is that uh, they actually changed genders multiple times throughout their life. And actually, I think we're even married to people of multiple, uh, married to multiple people of gender, of different genders. Um, and so there, uh, when they came to the uh, attention of Spanish authorities, they revealed that they were intersex. And that's one of the reasons that uh, they were able to mold themselves so freely, according to them. Right. And so they were actually consistently referenced in uh, Spanish medical texts throughout the 15 to 17 and 1800s about intersex people. Elena de Céspedes became famous, actually, uh, for doing what they wanted and also uh, for finding ways to make a life uh, where before they might have been simply reduced to being an unhappy woman. Mary Jones uh, was uh, another entrepreneur uh, just like Eleno and just like Victoria in New York in the early 1800s. Uh, I think the really interesting thing here is that just like Victoria, Mary Jones also talks about the acceptance that she has from her community in Louisiana and uh, in New Orleans and in New York. She came to the um, attention of the authorities because uh, basically she kept robbing her Johns. Um, <laughs> she would take their wallets and would replace them with the wallet of a client that she had had beforehand. She was a sex worker as well. Uh, but she also, she did, she did other things. She also worked as a tailor. She also worked, uh, um, uh, as a, as a waiter as well. And so this is one of the few images of Mary Jones that we had prior to very recently, but because of the work of brilliant black trans women, we're able to have more images uh, that we can have for our memory, right? So this is a still of uh, Rowan Amon, who's playing Mary Jones in Tourmaline's recent film, Salacia, uh, which came out last year and is a short film about the life, a day in the life of Mary Jones, who lived in a free black community of New York in the early 1800s. Frances Thompson was also uh, another famous free black trans woman. And so she was born a slave uh, in uh, the South, but was freed during emancipation and uh, settled in Memphis. And so was a victim of uh, sexual violence and rape in the race riots. Race riots really is a pogrom. What in fact happened is that with the help of the police, uh, white people in Memphis in 1866 set fire to many to many of the black people's homes in Memphis and ran them out of town at gunpoint. And then, uh, as people some people were running out of their homes, would uh, shoot them. And so, uh, this was a not quite a race riot. What it was was a massacre. It was a racist massacre. And so, Frances Thompson became the first black woman to testify before Congress in 1866 because uh, she was she organized black women to go to Congress in order to testify and let them know what happened. And this was and she was the inspiration for Congress passing many of the laws to protect black people, the few laws to protect black people that they did during Reconstruction. Unfortunately, in the 90s, her in the in the 1890s, her status uh, was discovered. Um, uh, by someone or revealed publicly. And so uh, the Congress and many white racists use her trans identity as a way to say that she was choosing to deceive society because she was a trans woman. And therefore that she was also making up the many stories and that all black women had been making up the stories of sexual violence that they experienced during the massacres and the many uh, pogroms of reconstruction. And uh, there is a quotation from Sultana Isham as well. William Dorothy Swan was known as uh, the queen in Washington, D.C., my hometown, in the uh, immediate time after World War II. I'm sorry, after the Civil War, not World War II. And so I put some of these quotations here because honestly, I think their goals a little bit. So they were famous. Uh, throughout the medical establishment. So they were called, so uh, 
They were accused of keeping an organization of colored erotopaths by Dr. Charles Hamilton, Hamilton Hughes in the 1880s. Uh, the, Dr. Irving Ross described uh, Swan's group as a band of Negro men with androgynous characteristics, which is also goals. And then finally, the U.S. Attorney General singled out William Dorothy Swan, saying his evil example in the community must have been the most corrupting. And so this is a person with not only a high profile, but some excellent organizing skills. And those organizing skills were consistently um, shown, especially when they were incarcerated uh, for the second time in 1896 for, for having a drag ball at their home in D.C., and their friend uh, with, with William chose to petition the president of the United States. So we are seeing in 1896, 30 people going on record that they care about the wealth, about the livelihood and the well-being of a gender non-conforming person in the 1890s, right? And so this is when people say that we weren't around, that our communities have never cared for us or that we're new or that this is all a lie. It is a function of power. It's a function of power. All of these people were surrounded by communities who deeply loved them and who missed them when they were gone. Bonus. <laughs> so there was a, uh, in 1971 or 72, Huey P. Newton released a letter to the Black Panther Party about the gay and lesbian rights movements or gay and lesbian power movements where he, where he talked about the fact that it's no longer, he is growing and the fact that it was, he is uh, creating a strong coalition with the people who were part of the Stonewall riots and so, and who came out of that. But what is less well talked about is the fact that he actually met Sylvia Rivera in person at the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention of 1970. Sylvia Rivera had taken some money from the organization that she had just founded, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionary, and had gone to DC uh, because she said, if all the gay rights people are gonna be there, then STAR, which is the name of the organization that she founded, needs to be there too. So. Huey P. Newton apparently referred to her as the queen from New York, talked about how the Black Panther Party was fully in support of the work that she did, and they had a full five-minute conversation. People a lot of times credit the white gay movement with the change in Huey P. Newton's uh, positions about homophobia and transphobia in the Black Panther Party, but I actually personally believe that it was the organizing that he recognized and could really give credence to uh, of the street kids and of the drag queens, et cetera, as Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P called themselves, who were doing that work to bring a large coalition together to fundamentally change how power operated in the United States. Unfortunately, that did not come to fruition then, but we also have a lot of time since then, right? So now what I would like for us to do uh, is to spend five minutes just um, doing a brief reflection for ourselves, thinking about our future, right? Um, and th these are questions that I would like for us to respond to. We've been looking at a world system that has been created by very few people with lots of power through warfare, through demonization, through Christianity, uh, through patriarchy, and through ableism and many other systems of oppression, right? That basically excludes people based on how their bodies are shaped what they choose to do with those bodies, and that the reason that they gave for that in many cases was gender. That that system continues to impact everyone, but has also resulted in a culture of total impunity for the violence that happens against trans and gender nonconforming people of color, and especially against black and indigenous people. And so that is one of the reasons why we see the, the, the murder rates and the rates of death among uh, trans and gender nonconforming black and indigenous people to be so high in places that are experiencing or have experienced colonialism or are included in a colonial world system. And so I want us to think about how we get out of that, how we, how we move together when we're not that, but also about the legacy that we have of people already choosing to opt out of that, no matter the consequences. And so I want us to build a vision for ourselves here what would your body look like and be like without oppression and exploitation? How would you be shaped? 
How would you move? What things would be a part of you? What would be like your cyborg parts, if we're using a different word? And then finally, how would your community treat this body and how would your body make community? Let's take five minutes, so from now until uh, 10 till, um, to just do some thinking about that and to do some reflecting. Um, Nico, could you give us some music for that?
Thanks, everybody. So let's um, come back and go to our final Q&A section of the day here. So I'm going to uh, put my screen here so you all can see my face. I love seeing everybody's face. <laughs> so uh, our first question is, are there ways that people from Car Caribbean islands or Caribbean islands or West Indian background can reckon with the very problematic mindset that the colonial gender binary has wrought in their music and culture and families without totally giving up said music and culture and families? Whew, absolutely. Uh, I myself am a person of uh, Caribbean descent. My father is Jamaican from Montego Bay. And so I would definitely say that it is possible for us to reckon with the mindset, right? Does it mean that we can immediately change our families and our societies? Unfortunately, no. I wish that knowing things mm -hmm. could automatically change society. Um, but what, But there is a major legacy as well of people to of people who have already been doing this work to look at i would say that um an anthology that has been really uh beautiful for me is uh thomas glaives our caribbean uh, which is an anthology of writing by a uh, gay lesbian i think most i think only at this point gay and lesbian people um from the caribbean uh but has a lot about gender nonconformity and trans identity in it and how it impacts uh, the experience of people who have been colonized. Uh, I would also say that having a conversation with our families about the way that the gender binary harms everyone because of racism and white supremacy is really um, something that I would just recommend more and more people doing as much as possible. I think it's one way to make this really understandable and um, deeply uh, concrete for people is to understand that there's a co that that we're that we're all part of the coalition that's being uh, forced out of <laughs> power because of how we don't measure up. Um, are there any other questions? Is the way we understand and use the term gender and West gender Western slash colonial? Should we deconstruct the category altogether to understand the ways gender is expressed and understood across culture? Gender the second time is in quotation marks. Yes, is the answer to that. <laughs> Maria Lugones' work, actually, I just referenced her earlier, uh, talking about the coloniality of gender. She, her point, uh, one that she makes actually in that paper is that it's not only that gender oppression is introduced uh, against people who are not uh, men and women like in Europe, uh, but that also the idea of gender itself, the idea that you have a body and that body, the way that it's shaped, determines your social role for your entire life with no exceptions is a very Western idea, as a matter of fact. And so, and, and that, uh, that your identity is what can be physically perceived about you, right? Is also a very Western idea. Um, and so we could, in fact, deconstruct that category and the relationship between those all together, but I haven't yet found an amazing exact way to do so in English, you know? Um, I have another uh, question. Um, asking me to talk about um, some of the ways that uh, gender is normalized through surgeries performed on children. Um, and so there, uh, the, the work of uh, Sean Saifa Wall actually is an activist who I would recommend everyone check out on this. Um, I won't type that name into the chat here. Um, And uh, they're an intersex. They're an intersex activist based, I believe, out of the Midwest, um, who's been doing a lot of work to connect how uh, violence against the violence against intersex people in Atlanta. I'm getting a correction here. He's in Atlanta. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so Saifa is ba based. Uh, is based out of Atlanta, and is and Pigeon, got, got it. Their main their main co-organizer oftentimes. Uh, 
is based out of Chicago. Thank you for that correction. And so the two of them are oftentimes doing work to illuminate the connections between violence against intersex people and white supremacy. What is true is that uh, the same doctors who invented the idea of binary sex by looking at a lot of children and a lot of uh, did so by look by by examining a bunch of different people, um, many of whom were intersex. And so they came up with theories about intersex people and how they were abnormal, even though, as we said earlier, power is the only thing that determined them as such. Intersex people are extraordinarily common. And so uh, they created this theory that intersex, that an intersex nature is primitive and therefore uh, has more expression amongst primitive people, as they were saying. Let's remember that the times that these books were being written like the evolution of sexes, for example, by Geddes by uh, Jed, uh, Jedis Thompson, um, or uh, whom, who else am I thinking of? Um, the work of Francis Dal Dalton, for example. Francis Galton, a famous eugenicist, and actually the corner of the term eugenics, um, was deeply involved in uh, the creation of the idea of what makes men men and what makes women women physically. And so many of the people who were creating the ideas that we now have debunked thoroughly about the scientific and biological divisions between the races were the same people creating the ideas about the scientific and biological distinctions between the sexes. And so uh, what is true is that uh, in the 19, starting in the 1940s and 50s, I believe, they decided to start operating on infants on newborns without their parents, uh, without and with their parents' consent, but always without those children's consent, to normalize the appearance of their bodies, oftentimes their genitalia, such that they looked and functioned like binary sex genitalia should. And of course, there were very patriarchal norms for what, and sexist norms for what genitalia were supposed to be shaped like. One example is that oftentimes if people did not were thought to be that we decide that the scientists or surgeons would decide, hey, we want this person to live their life as a girl or woman. And so that means that they need a functioning vagina in their vulva. And what that means is that instead of, for example, allowing that person's body to do what it would normally do and to grow like it normally would, they created a false orifice inside of that body because the definition of vagina means that it needs to be white enough wide enough, sorry, <laughs> Freudian slip there, wide enough to fit, a, to fit the average male penis, according to science, right? And so the idea is that women are shaped to be receptors for, for male genitalia or for genitalia that is considered male in, our, in, 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 in Western society, right? And so that is, uh, in a way, the way that intersex, that Violence against intersex people through surgeries has also normalized violence against women generally. Uh, I have one question here. What are your thoughts of using the incredible biodiversity we find in nature as one starting place for debunking the binary? I love, love, love that idea and would love more and more people to do it all the time. So um, yet another person who is just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, is uh, Jess Chen, who has written, who wrote an entire uh, open letter, I believe, that was a poem to the Pope <laughs> uh, a few years ago that talked all about how nature is just so queer. And so one of the things that, one of many of the examples that they gave in the poem were bees and the fact that bees don't have a gender system in the way that we do. Um, there are so many so many, so many examples. So many, so many examples from nature about how, you know, because animals are definitely, anim non-human animals are definitely not sitting around here wondering if they're being manly or masculine enough. That's just not the reality. They're living their lives. And so, you know, we, we, def we definitely should be too. <laughs> so I would definitely check, encourage everybody to check out their, their work, especially as well as if you're in a more academic mood, checking out uh, Greta Gard uh, toward a queer ecofeminism. And I'm also typing that here, toward a queer ecofeminism.
So uh, with that said, there are like a thousand more questions that we can answer, but we're also at time here. And so I want to just wrap up um, by saying thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you so much for giving your time to this. I really, really appreciate, uh, really, really appreciate the, the time and the thought that you all have put into this. Um, I'm, I guess I should share my screen one more time because I have a slide that says thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you is really what I have to say here. Thank you so much. I uh, would really encourage you to consist consistently uh, check out the work of Black trans women who are around you and doing brilliant work all the time. As we can see, we exist in their legacy and so would not have been able to do any of this without them, as well as the people who have organized uh, to keep them and our community alive. So uh, there will be uh, evaluations as the part of this um, and resources will go out after this. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.